So this is the point where it's good to grab your Bibles and open them up at uh, the book of Colossians. And we're going to be looking at the uh, end of chapter one and the beginning of chapter two, that, that section that takes us from uh, chapter one, verse 24, uh, through to chapter two, uh, verse five. As I was kind of thinking a bit more about Colossians this week and, and, and preparing um, some stuff for this evening, I, I was kind of thinking it must have been really, really exciting to be in Colossae, particularly for Epaphras, who was the guy who... Um, uh, shared the gospel, shared the news about Jesus with the people. And as we read about the really good start they made, I thought it must, it must have been a really exciting time. Uh, we read it, read in chapter one, didn't we, how they learned the gospel from Epaphras. Uh, and apparently that um, in that place, just as it was doing throughout the world, the gospel was bearing fruit and growing as they heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. That must have been really exciting uh, to be a part of. Um, and I guess what we're, where we're picking things up in the letter of Colossians is they've clearly made a good start. And uh, now it's all about, well, will they continue? Uh, will they put down roots? Will they grow to maturity? Some of the words that we've picked up so far. And if you're, um, I hope you're, you're using your notebook as a, a tool to help you. Uh, here's mine. Uh, some of the words that we've seen. And you, these are the sorts of things that you might have noted down in, in your notebook as we've gone. But we've seen. Uh, things like words like growing and being strengthened, uh, having endurance, uh, continuing, uh, being established and firm. And then towards the end of last week's reading was not, not being moved from the hope held out in the gospel. And that's the sort of picture that we're getting as Paul writes this letter of what he wants uh, for them. He wants them to be standing firm uh, like that giant oak uh, that we saw um, in uh, a previous week. Um, that's not going to be moved no matter what um, is thrown at it. But the other thing I also thought a little bit as I as I thought about Colossians was it, it um, I, the parable of the sower just keeps coming to my mind as I read this letter. Um, it's a parable that Jesus told about um, how different people respond to hearing the word of God, um, hearing that the message about Jesus. And it's clear that they're not like the seed that's sown on the path uh, because they're people who don't even receive and believe the word, but they have done that. Uh, but then I think the danger is that they might become like um, the, uh, the seed that um, uh, never puts down roots and comes and gets eaten by the birds, uh, or the seed that starts to grow but gets sort of overcrowded and choked out um, by, by the thorns around. And I think that's the real danger for the, the Colossian Christians, that they never grow to become strong and established. Um, the one that has no roots lasts only a short time when troubles come, when difficulties come. And at that point, they fall away. The one that's, that's choked by thorns, well, it's the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things that come and just choke out, uh, choke the message of the word so that they, um, so it doesn't become fruitful. Well, that's a bit of an introduction. Just a few things, I guess, that I thought as I, as I looked at the book of Colossians, how exciting it must have been as they received the gospel. And also how relevant the parable of the sower seems to be for the responses uh, or the possible responses uh, among these new Christians in Colossae. Uh, Heidi's pointed us already to last week how um, uh, Paul was really reminding them just of how amazing the son is, how amazing Jesus is. And well, they have everything they need in him. Uh, so why would they move uh, elsewhere? Why would they go elsewhere? Why would they leave them behind? Um, and I guess today, as we look at our passage today, there's sort of two main ideas that we're going to see, and I wanted to just point out before we have a chance to read it. Uh, the first is the idea of a mystery. Uh, you'll notice the word mystery comes up three times uh, in this passage, and uh, we're going to think a little bit about that. Uh, the second is what's the connective for this passage. I've mentioned these connectives before. Paul sort of mentions an idea, and then in the following section, he really expands on that idea. So at the end of our first passage in chapter 14 of verse 1, we're 13 and 14, he mentions the sun. And then in the next passage, 15 to 23, he expands on who the sun is. And then we get to the end of that in verse 23, and he mentions that he's a servant of the gospel. And now in this passage today, he really expands on what that means to be a servant uh, of the gospel for him. And we'll pick up on some of those ideas as we read it through. But I think both these ideas of, of the mystery and the servant of the gospel are so actually closely connected because Paul's role as a servant of the gospel is to make known the mystery um, so that people can know about um, Jesus. Uh, that's what the mystery is all about uh, and can uh, believe in him 
and uh, live for him. So that's Paul's main task as, as a servant, to let people know. And we'll discover, you'll read in verses 25 and 26, this was once a mystery, but actually now it's a mystery that's been revealed, uh, that's been made known. I, I sort of think maybe it's a little bit about, if, a little bit like if um, uh, perhaps someone's throwing you a surprise party and uh, there's kind of lots of whispers around and plans in place, but you're sort of kept out of the loop. You kind of know something's happening. You know something's going on. You know there's a party coming, but you don't know any of the details at all. And I wonder if it's a little bit, that, a little bit like that, that in the Old Testament, there's the promise of a saviour. Uh, they know he's coming. Uh, they know that it's, it's, it's coming up. Uh, but until he actually comes, and at this point in, in the New Testament, as Jesus arrives and Paul explains it, where well, now they find out all the details. Now the mystery uh, is revealed and made known. And that's Paul's task as a servant of the gospel uh, to make known the mystery. But let me give you one final thought before I, I set you loose on this passage and, and give you some time uh, to read it. Uh, because I guess as we look at the word mystery, well, certainly in the early church, we see this was actually the worst kept secret. Uh, it was spreading like wildfire from one town to the next. It appears it was almost sort of being gossiped across the garden fence as it, as it was shared in a town from, from one person to the next. The news of Jesus was the worst kept secret. It was spreading. People were hearing uh, and people were believing. And as I thought about that, I wondered if perhaps today it is one of the best kept secrets. Perhaps today we're not as good at sharing this mystery. We're not as good at making it known. People perhaps have heard of Jesus, know about him, but, but they don't know all, that, all about who he is and the things that he's done. Perhaps today it is the best kept secret. I think it's certainly true that um, uh, there's all sorts of things coming to the surface in people's lives now, all sorts of difficult things um, brought about by the pandemic. And it's not that these things weren't there before. Um, they were, but they've just been intensified during the pandemic. And they're coming to the service now. And I think actually the message of Jesus, this mystery, uh, is exactly the news that we need to help us during these difficult days. Somebody was sharing with me uh, just yesterday about how she felt at the moment in the world there were so many crises. It just seemed it was one thing after another at the moment. And people were just feeling um, hopeless about the future, really. Uh, just full of despair as just kind of... Um, uh, one thing after another seems to be falling apart in our country and in our world. And as she shared that to me, she said, I think the church needs to have a real voice at this time to let people know that there is real hope in Jesus. We need to no longer let this be the best kept secret, but we need to let people know that there is great hope uh, for now uh, and hope for the future, that the message of Jesus can make all the difference to people at the moment. And we need to not keep it a secret, uh, but share it far and wide. Though I can't see what's before me I know that I can trust your heart And this one truth will be my story You still reign in your still God I will declare that you are with
well, let me say, as it's exam season at the moment, that's now time to put your pencils down. I hope uh, you've had a good time uh, reading through uh, that passage. Hope you had a chance to read it through a couple of times. Um, there's loads in there, isn't there? Uh, loads in this section, actually. Um, let, let me just say one other thing. So I, I don't know how you're doing your notebook. I, for me, I've, I've got a page at the front where I'm putting just some general stuff that I'm seeing about Colossians as we go, some of the sort of the, the bigger picture um, and, and the background stuff, some of the big themes. And then I've just got a, um, a, a page for each of the passages that we've had so far where I jot down some notes and then in breakout rooms have a chance to jot down some other things that, that people see and that sort of thing. And uh, just slowly building up a bit of a... Uh, um, yeah, a, 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 bit of, a bit of a book with all the details about the stuff that we've seen. So I hope you're finding that, that useful to do. Let, let me say one or two things before we go to breakout rooms. Uh, the first thing is about this mystery. Um, I, I don't know what you saw and discovered about it. Um, we find in, in verse uh, 25 that it's the word of God in all its fullness, as that mystery is now disclosed. Uh, we discover in, in 2 verse 2 that the mystery of God is namely Christ. Uh, and I love that. It's so simple, isn't it? Uh, simply all that Jesus is and all that he's done for us. And I wonder if Paul's just almost referencing back to the passage before that Heidi mentioned uh, at the start. Um, actually, it's all that he's made known about who Jesus is and what he's done for us. Well, that is the mystery that he's making known to them and that he wants them to, to understand. I don't know what things you noticed about Paul as he um, works as a servant of the gospel uh, to make the mystery of known. You might have spotted things like, um, firstly, it involves suffering. Uh, suffering for them it's the first thing he said um, it involves a task to present the word of God to them in the in, in its fullness and actually his, his role as a servant of the gospel is, is all about Jesus he says in verses 28 and 29 that it's Jesus we proclaim it's Jesus we proclaim um, teaching and admonishing people with all wisdom so that they would present them mature in Christ there's the goal there's what he wants for them uh, maturity and as he goes on, well, we discover that for Paul um, and uh, Timothy and the other workers, well, it involves a lot of hard work. And he uses words like he's strenuously uh, contending um, how hard he is working for them. Uh, but it's with the, the power that Jesus gives that is working in him uh, that he does this work. Well, I wonder, as we uh, have read through this passage, whether, whether one of the steps to maturity how they're to grow to maturity is something that's perhaps not overly popular. Um, it's growing in knowledge and understanding. Now, did you see that a few times? Uh, he mentioned uh, they may have the full riches of complete understanding in verse two of chapter two. Um, talks about all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ. And he wants them to know the mystery of God. So perhaps the first step to us growing in maturity is that we just need to know the truth, know the truth of the Bible know the truth of all that Jesus has done for us better. And we do that by doing things like this, by reading the Bible. I love it when I hear about people who are reading Christian books, uh, which are helping them to grow in the knowledge, they'd understand this mystery of God, they'd understand it better. Um, I, I love it when I see people making notes in, in church or in Bible study groups. They're wanting to, to, to grow as they get to, know, um, uh, they get to know the mystery of the gospel uh, better. And uh, we should really seek and desire that. Uh, because that is uh, one of the steps towards growing in maturity. I think it's the first step that we see here um, we see here in Colossians. Well, I've mentioned the connectives as we go. Uh, the connective that leads us from this passage into the next passage, and we'll, um, we'll see that next week, is he says in verse 4, and here we start to get a little bit of a clue of the cultural context. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. There's people trying to lead the Colossians astray. And... As he gets into the next section, the rest of chapter two, well, we get, he's going to expand on that idea of the sort of arguments, fine sounding arguments that people are using to try and lead them astray and that he's trying to counter as he writes this letter to them uh, so that they may know the mystery of Christ and be presented and mature in him as they grow in their knowledge and understanding of him.